Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. And for those of you joining us live on the webinar, could you please feel free to leave your name uh, in chat and um, tell us what you teach. And also, uh, if you are not with us uh, live, then, you know, you can contact us uh, for PD after the fact. I am going to go ahead and start this. My name is Stacy Graham. I work for the Center for Historic Preservation, as you know, with the Teaching with Primary Sources program. And uh, today I am joined by Ken Mosier, who is a PhD student at MTSU and a graduate research assistant working also on this program with us. Um, he's also an in-classroom teacher. So uh, just going over a few things at the beginning, like we usually do. Um, thank you for joining us again. Best practices, just a quick word. Uh, please keep your mics muted. Now there might be times when we want you to contribute verbally uh, to the conversation. So in those cases, when, you know, when we invite it, please feel free to unmute yourself and to uh, use your voice. Um, otherwise, feel free to just leave your comments in the chat throughout the whole webinar. Uh, one or the other of us will be checking it during the webinar. Um, and let's see. So again, you can uh, chat with us. We, we don't have any polls for today, but you can feel free to use your reaction emojis uh, at any time. It's kind of nice to have some sort of interaction while we're doing this. And um, you can interact with each other in the chat box as well uh, and have your own conversations while we're, we're going on. Now, we do have a Padlet. Um, I'm not sure how many resources we have on it for, uh, for this week. Um, Kira's usually a bit more on top of it than I am. But you can see on the screen, here is the link for the Padlet. And uh, it is the link for all of our digging in Padlets. So if you have ever gone to this website before, it's the same one, but just with a new column added. And this is where if we have any kind of additional materials that we bring out during the webinar, um, we plop them in right here so you can have them all in one spot. Feedback. We'd love to hear your thoughts. As always, uh, more feedback makes our program better and makes our offerings better. So uh, please fill out this form, uh, which you can access through the URL or through the QR code. Um, please, uh, I will flash this again at the end of the webinar, um, but this will also get you uh, that professional development credit. Okay, so in that case, I'm going to find where my mouse, I can't seem to find my cursor, excuse me. Okay, I found it. Stop sharing. And I am going to uh, share my screen so that we can look at the newsletter together and start talking about uh, this month's theme. So I'm going to share that screen. Okay. And all right, here we are. Um, I'm going to make it a little bit larger to make it a little easier to see. Okay, so hopefully you will receive this already. If not, of course, it's available on our website as usual. Uh, we picked the 1850s as a, wait, yes, yes. 1850s, excuse me. There it is, right in front of me. Um, as our topic, and I know that this is a very, very, this is more narrow of a focus than we usually do, but we just felt like this period is such a crucible for the nation, and there's so many complicated things going on and things that are all related, but in slightly different ways. So we thought this would give us an opportunity to educate ourselves more on how all these different pieces fit together. And, um, you know, also... Uh, try to provide even more resources on this um, this mid nineteenth century period uh, for uh, both elementary and high school teachers. So before I mention the eighteen fifties theme, I do want to mention a couple of our news items, 
which is that we have our two-day uh, summer workshop in June 5th and 6th. This is going to take place at Fisk University in Nashville. And our theme is education for all. And we will be exploring reconstruction in Jim Crow periods and how education in African-American schools built a foundation for the long civil rights movement of the 20th century. So that'll be great. We'll be on site. We'll get to see some cool special collections. We'll um, get to do some field work as well. And then it's not too early to save the date for the Tennessee Council for History Education Conference, which is not going to be in Nashville this year. It's almost always in Nashville. So please make a note. It's going to be in Memphis. And that's going to be September the 26th at the Memphis Museum of Science and History. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that uh, in the coming months. Okay, the 1850s. So um, I like to sometimes load a lot of links into the little theme blurb uh, to make the theme blurb also do additional work uh, and to give us more places to give you resources so that it's not a throwaway section uh, that you should just skip every issue. It's, it's, I try to make it so that it has some content. So for instance, we've got some good links in here about the compromise of 1850. That's two different links right there. Um, the first one is a Today in History piece, which is a very short article about kind of the debate in the Senate leading up to the, um, the Compromise of 1850. And the second one, okay, so that one uh, talked about uh, Daniel Webster's speech when he was trying to encourage Americans to accept the Compromise. And then the second link is to a speech by Thomas Hart Benton, who is on the other side of the issue, and he's against it. And so that might be, um, if you have time, a, a good way to uh, compare the, the, the two speeches uh, if you have like a spe specifically a government civics class. And then, of course, part of the Compromise of 1850, which is probably the most controversial part, is the Fugitive Slave Law. And so the, excuse me, I opened in a new window. I like to open in a new tab. There we go. This was fascinating to me because uh, this tells the story about, a, you know, uh, an enslaved person who lived in Kentucky and he fled to Oberlin, Ohio, where he was protected for a couple of years by um, abolitionist minded people. And then he was arrested by a federal marshal and he on his way back to Kentucky, they stopped for the night in another Ohio city. And then a bunch of people from Oberlin joined a bunch of people from that city uh, in Ohio, which was called Wellington and sprung him free in this kind of, big kind of chaotic event and uh, is called the Oberlin Wellington Rescue of 1858. And so, uh, but they get caught. There's like 37 people trying to free this enslaved person who was being dragged back to Kentucky. And before they, you know, were able to make it out of Ohio, um, this happened. And so, um, for resisting the federal slave, the fugitive slave law, 37 people were arrested. And I there it's really interesting to hear kind of what went down. Um so authorities in Ohio, sympathetic to the rescuers and opposed to many you know, provisions of the act, reacted by arresting the federal marshal and other officers who captured Price, charging them with kidnapping. And then it went all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court uh, because they were trying to force the issue to the US Supreme Court, but the Ohio Supreme Court actually upheld the legality of this law. And it's kind of interesting because today that's also what's happening. There are a lot of challenges to laws and state Supreme Courts hopefully with the intent that it'll make up to the U.S. Supreme Court 
And that's why we've had a lot of dramatic events taking place in the U.S. Supreme Court lately. Um, but anyway, they, they eventually negotiated this release where 35 of 37 people arrested were, were uh, set free. Um, and they they did actually help the formerly enslaved man. They, he got to smuggle himself up to Canada. So that was the good news is that he was freed by this act. Um, and then the they Ohio dropped the kidnapping charges and then the two people who were still convicted so that's what was the upshot two people were arrested they were the ones who tried to push it with the supreme court but then they failed so that's a really interesting you know you hear a lot about dred scott but there were other people whose stories are just as fascinating uh they just didn't make it all the way up to the u.s supreme court uh so this is a, a really good kind of maybe a bell ringer to introduce your students. And so that is linked to from Fugitive Slave Law. Um, and then there's a really fantastic map. There's going to be more maps when I talk about the Gadsden Purchase. But for right now, I want to show you this wonderful map about slave versus free states. Because, of course, the 1850s is all about the lead up to the Civil War with the clashes between slave states and free states. And um, everything that happens pretty much in the United States that we're going to talk about is going to uh, lead into this issue. So this map right here, um, I like it because it's easy to read and it's easy to see. And then, of course, if you really want to zoom in, it's got a lot of statistics. So we've got, um, and this is 1856. Um, so you can see the the black states are the ones where uh, enslavement is legal, and then the pink ones where it's illegal, and then we have the territories. And you can see the Missouri Compromise line right here from 1820, uh, I believe. Uh, and this is you know, some of the new territory that we're gonna talk about in just a minute. Um, and then you have Comparison of the chief statistics of the free states and of the slave states according to the U.S. Census of 1850. And so they take apart um, from these different states here, the free states and then later on the slave states. They talk about the area, the white population, the free black population, the slave population, the total population per square mile, value, et cetera. So it's, it's really interesting. You could do a lot with this map. Uh, you can also just kind of spend a little bit of time just so they can get the visualization in their minds of where the nation is at uh, mid-decade. Um, all right. And then I have a, just a couple more links for you in this. Uh, I don't like talking about history as being inevitable, but uh, some historians are not afraid to use that word. And so this link right here that says it's hard to look at the events of the 1850s and not use that word, that takes you to this New York Times article, Was the Civil War Inevitable? And if I have an account through MTSU, so I'm able to access this article. I know sometimes you don't have access to the New York Times, um, but if you do, uh, and if you have the time, this is well worth a read. This is by David Blight, one of the foremost scholars of the Civil War era in the United States today. Um, and it uh, brings in some contemporary issues and it talks, it grounds it in the issue of the Dred Scott case. And it's just a really fantastic read um, for, for those of you who maybe have high school students who are, uh, have the ability to dig into that a little bit further. Um, and then lastly, the looming Civil War. There's a really great primary source set from the Library of Congress teachers page uh, that talks about this decade right here, the nation moves toward war. And so uh, here we have a lot of really great kind of ephemera, maps, printed political cartoons, and then your teacher's guide that goes with it, along with a really cool little timeline that's really helpful for teaching this decade as well. All right. So that's that. And then I'm going to move on to the Gadsden Purchase. And so this is the first of two lesson ideas that we're going to be highlighting during this, uh, this episode today. And I picked the Gadsden Purchase because, 
you know, I, I knew that it was that little strip of land at the bottom of New Mexico and Arizona that was, you know, used to be a part of Mexico and became a part of the United States as part of this purchase. Uh, but I had no idea kind of what its significance was. And so this was, you know, enlightening for me. And of course, it's all about the expansion of slavery, uh, like everything else at this time. Even though, uh, so so the issue of the Mexican War of Independence, the Mexican-American War, the, the Texas War of Independence, all these things have to do with the expansion of slavery and how that's going to happen in these New World lands. And um, of course, the Mexican-American War had happened in the mid-1840s, so just a few years before this. And so the question is, what are we going to do with this land, uh, this free, these territories? Are they going to be slaves or are they going to be free? And also the border between the United States and Mexico hadn't really been clarified at the end of that war. Uh, the Rio Grande was sort of to El Paso, but then that area between El Paso and San Diego not quite uh, totally surveyed. So this is the purchase that actually created that part of the border. So once this was in, the entire borders of the contiguous 48 states were set and they are still the same today. Um, and so you're like, well, what's the point of that little piece of land? Like, why is that significant? So um, this talks about... Uh, in the second paragraph, that this treaty was negotiated. Uh, of course, the president at the time was Franklin Pierce. And Franklin Pierce was friends with his Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, who had a friend named James Gadsden. And what they wanted to do was find the land to build a transcontinental railroad through the southern states because there was no transcontinental railroad yet, but that was a dream for speculators and for, you know, all sorts of uh, everybody who had business interests in the United States. And so they were like, oh, if we can have a Southern route, then we can stay out of the North and not have to deal with those Northern states or the free states or the free territories at all. This dream did not materialize until 1881. And that was 12 years after the Transcontinental Railroad was actually created that went up through like Utah in 1869. Um, but during the 1850s, this was the dream. And so this was part of the reason why they wanted to get this land from Mexico. So they could have so so they could have um less interference with the spread of slavery in the United States. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of these links in here. Now, this link isn't part of the lesson, but it is part of the context because this area had been scouted for quite a bit. There had been scouts going through different areas of the West for a long time. And don't freak out that this is 449 pages because only the last two pages talk about the Gadsden Purchase land. Uh, so all you have to do is read the last two pages, which are, you know, I think they're quite charming. Um, and it's appendix number uh, seven. And so this is a surveyor who is traveling through this land. He starts off on the Kearney Trail and then he deviates from it because and goes down into the northern Mexican state of Sonora uh, to just check out the land and report back on it uh, to see what it might be good for. And... Um, so this took place before the Gadsden Purchase. You can see this is part of an 1847 um, expedition. So uh, he's talking about the landscape and the smooth prairie and how many miles from one place to another and the fact that there's really not a lot of water there. Um, he talks about Tucson, which at that time was a town of 500 people and uh, spelled differently as well. But Tucson, Arizona, of course, is one of the major cities in the land that was previously part of the Gadsden Purchase that your students may have heard of today. And, um, and then he's going along the Gila River. And so on the second part of this, oof, excuse me. 
I'm zooming a little bit too much. Uh, he's talking about like where the land gets all hilly uh, versus where it's smooth. And then the fact that there's not hardly any trees around there, but there is a lot of rock, which is good for when you're thinking about what you're going to need to build. He talks about the grass being good for grazing cattle on, which is good when you're thinking about expanding ranches. And then, of course, he does mention also a country abounding in exceedingly rich gold mines. Well, that's handy to know, right? That the land that uh, you're soon going to buy from Mexico has a lot of gold mines on it. So um, that uh, if you're interested in going in that direction, um, that's that's a neat source to use. So for the lesson idea, there is a link to a little contextual article, and it really is very short, which is one of the Today in History articles. And it uh, so it talks about the signing of this treaty. This They signed it in Mexico City. Um, uh, Santa Ana was constantly in and out of power in Mexico, and he kind of had a bit of a chaotic political career around this time, but he managed to be in, in power during this time that this took place. And uh, the, the interpretation is that he felt like, well, I could sell it to the U.S. and make money off it now, or if I wait, they'll just steal it from me in war or or like wrest it from Mexico in future skirmishes or wars later on and I'll just lose it. So he kind of took advantage of this offer of the United States to to sell it and actually make some money off of it. Um and there he is. Uh and talk and then just two more paragraphs about that. So you can start off with that and then we've got three different maps that we're going to compare. One is the before map. And so you want students to be like, okay, what did it look like before that border was fixed? And I'm going to try to zoom in for you. And there are so many maps from this time period and you can talk about why were they creating so many maps? You know, why was the federal government so interested in knowing exactly what lay out there? And of course that has to do with territorial ac acquisition and uh, location of resources and things like that. So you can see that the border is actually, here's the Rio Grande right here. It's got this little pink line on it and it goes straight up into this weird little kind of panhandle thing. And then all this other stuff is still part of Mexico. Uh, and called Upper California. And so you can see the, the Colorado River and the Gila River. And so um, Paso del Norte, right there, that's El Paso. And San Diego, you can see that over here on the coast. So the area between those two is what is going to be kind of at stake later. So uh, Sonora and uh, also parts of Chihuahua, those are the Mexican states that are involved here. Um, and so then we can look at a map from 1852, which is before the Gadsden Purchase, but after the Mexican-American War. So what territory did Mexico see during the Mexican-American War? And of course, you probably will have already have covered that by the time you get to this lesson. So let's take a look. And like I said, I took I looked at a lot of maps, but I picked the ones that I thought would be the best for students to use. So here you can see this area with this kind of green line. And uh, so here's El Paso over here. So there's Texas on that side. And then here's New Mexico up here and the Arizona territory and then California. And then this whole part right below this thick green line is gonna be the Gadsden Purchase. And you can see Kearney's route that was mentioned in that 1847 survey report, that's marked on the map here. Um, and you can see what some of the little towns are and what other rivers are and be like, okay, then not a whole lot in terms of mountains, of course, which you wanna take into consideration when you're building a railroad. All right, so now let's look at the last map from 1852.
from 1858 after all is said and done. And this one is actually called Map of the Gadsden Purchase. So if you were to go on the Library of Congress website and search for Gadsden Purchase, you would be like taken to this map almost immediately. So it's pretty easy to find. But I love this map because it has so many different features on it. So make sure that you have students read the key. So what do all those little letters and symbols mean? So they've got Apaches. Well, we, we, we do want to know where the hostile Indians are. Mountains, gold placers, which is, um, you know, places where there was gold panning going on. Um, I love this thing about R for all water courses, pompously called Rios. I don't know why they said that. That seems very judgmental for a map maker. Um, and then the American forts, uh, Mexican villages, Indian villages, mining districts, and then the Sonora mining district. So all of these, you can talk with your students about why, what kinds of things do we need to know are, are where and why. And uh, so here's the line, nice and straight. Um, not a whole lot of hills until you get down here. And then here, all these pluses, these are the mines. So that wealth of gold mines that was referred to in that 1847 report, here we can see them. Um, and all the different Indian villages as well, and uh, all the different towns that were Mexican towns, but they are American towns now. And so then we have these black lines, these solid black lines are all these different proposed railroad routes. So they're already trying to think, where can we put this Southern Transcontinental Railroad? And uh, that was kind of the whole impetus behind it. Um, but yeah, so this is one that really brings in that uh, social studies practice standard 06 of geographical awareness. And it also brings in some of the context for what are the ties between the Mexican territories and the larger kind of political debate between slavery and freedom uh, and the expansion of that uh, as the U.S. itself expands. And now I am going to turn it over to Ken for our next lesson idea. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, today what I'm going to be talking about is um, the Austin Manifesto. And for many uh, students, this is going to be just as obscure as the Gadsden Purchase. Uh, but one of the things that I love about these small kind of background um, events in history is often they are the best canvas to kind of tie together the big things um, that students are familiar with. So I'm going to share my screen and see if this works. And hopefully that brings up the full screen. Okay, um, so we're going to start with some background information and then uh, go through the sources that I used in the lesson idea. All right, and let's see if I can. Video panel. Okay, so with Manifest Destiny, your kind of classic um, explanation for it is this uh, providential spread of American culture and politics across the North American continent. Um, most usually, this is uh, very Anglophilic and a very uh, kind of American Protestant vision um, that, again, is taught as uh, an inevitable East to West spread. We're going to go into more in just a second, looking at this uh, classic political cartoon uh, depicting the concept of Manifest Destiny. What often is not taught as much in terms of Manifest Destiny is the role that Southern plantation owners had in it. Uh, Southern plantation owners were some of the most fervent adherents to this concept of Manifest Destiny. And this tradition of Southern planters uh, or just Southern farmers wanting to expand territory quickly ties in nicely with earlier colonial concepts of uh, soil ruination and uh, agricultural dependent economy. 
um, going back to the cultivation of tobacco and then eventually uh, uh, graduating into the cultivation of cotton. But by the time we get to the 1850s, one of the dominant narratives uh, is not so much soil ruination and the actual viability of uh, creating um, working plantations as uh, the growth of political power. That is what the real driving factor is, uh, especially for the U.S. Senate. Uh, Dr. Graham hit on the importance of the balancing of the Senate during this decade, uh, because for Southerners, the Senate was the sole bulwark uh, standing against uh, House attempts in the House of Representatives to uh, curtail slavery uh, and at the worst of Southern fears to ban it outright. Now, balance is all well and good, but from a Southern perspective, if you could swing the balance of the Senate in your favor, all the better. Uh, the main goal is just to make sure that the uh, balance of power does not swing uh, toward the North. And so gaining additional uh, strongholds in territories was a key part of this. Now, most of the drama that you typically read about in textbooks having to do with the 1850s and Manifest Destiny happens in the West, uh, looking uh, specifically at uh, items like Bleeding Kansas or the Compromise of 1850. Um, what we're going to spend more time today looking at is how the drama unfolded southward, not just westward. One final point before we move into that, though, um, this idea of Manifest Destiny, the importance of uh, the West particularly um, in that phenomenon was uh, integrated into American mythmaking by Frederick Jackson Turner's The Frontier Thesis in 1893, which if you've never read that, uh, you should. Uh, it is a wonderful example of the kind of thinking that uh, dominated expansionists at the time, and it really lays the foundations for the lens that we look back at the 19th century through from modern times in terms of uh, the West being the most American part of America, about being the furnace in which Americanism is forged. Uh, that's all emanating from Turner. Um, it is uh, informative, entertaining, and beautifully written, if not deeply flawed. So here is that iconic image of Manifest Destiny. And here I'll just stop uh, and uh, ask you guys, uh, what do you see in this painting uh, that you could discuss with students as uh, the primary drivers of westward expansion from this artist perspective, at least? You'll forgive me, I'm a high school teacher. I've been teaching all the time, I'm still in question mode. Well, I see different forms of transportation. Absolutely. And tying in nicely with your lesson, right? If you want to weave these together, uh, the most important one that appears three times as opposed to the single appearance of all the other forms of transportation are the railroads, uh, including that most southerly route that is most certainly headed toward the Gaston Purchase. And we also see uh, the Native Americans being pushed kind of towards the left off of the screen. Off of the screen and into darkness. Um, and that's uh, yeah, that. yeah, that's right. The, the <clears throat> West is in the darkness and the East is in the sunlight. This is Karen. Could I say something? Absolutely. Um, I use this painting with my fourth graders. And we spend a lot of time analyzing it. Um, we come in to talk about Manifest Destiny after we've had breaks and done the Industrial Revolution. And so they automatically pick up on the electrical lines, the railroad, the, um, you know, the innovation. But I found a lot of my students voiced empathy with the darkness and the Native Americans being pushed out. Um, but they also talk about the farm uh, agriculture, too. So I was amazed at the conversations that came out at a fourth grade level uh, using this particular piece. Yeah, that is phenomenal, especially the empathy part. Uh, that's not something I necessarily would have uh, expected. Uh, I've used this for years and years uh, in standard history courses, and sometimes it's hard to get those juniors really fired up about it. So to hear that fourth graders were talking about it is phenomenal. Yeah. Okay, 
Anything else on this particular image before we move on? All right. So certainly you get from looking at it that from the perspective of this artist and from the perspective of many expansionists um, and in direct opposition to the uh, uh, very in-tune feelings of fourth graders, uh, expansion is only a good thing, right? Uh, empathy with the natives and with the darkness is not necessarily the predominant theme uh, that this artist is trying to get across, uh, you know, the light of Western civilization uh, and the angelic figure bringing it into the area are uh, the main focus and are presented in a near heroic fashion. Okay, so what is often left out of a narrative on uh, Manifest Destiny, though, is the idea of the South. And I really try to bring this in a lot, even when I talk about the Compromise of 1820. Um, because when you look at a initial map of the Compromise of 1820 and where the Compromise line was drawn and how much territory there was uh, that was going to be free and how much territory there was that was going to be slave, the obvious question is why would Southern lawmakers agree to that compromise at all? Um, and eventually students tend to come to the conclusion of, wait a minute, are they expecting to get territory somewhere else? And that's where you can start to lead into that conversation that, yeah, they had their eyes turned southward. Right. So in Southern minds, uh, destiny did not only manifest in the West, it also manifested in the South. Um, the areas that were already so dependent on plantation uh, economies, thanks to colonialism in Central America and the Caribbean, would easily mesh into the slaveholding power matrix. Uh, so it would not be a far reach to just simply pluck these economies up out of the hands of a foreign power and place them down uh, in the U.S. economy. And politically then expand the South's representation in the Senate as these areas became states. So a general timeline for how Cuba gets uh, tied up in all of this. In 1818, Spain opens Cuba up for international trade. Uh, really rapidly thereafter, uh, the United States becomes its primary trading partner. Hard to imagine looking back from our modern stance uh, where there's so little political interaction and economic interaction between the two. Uh, but we were by far the biggest partner uh, as of the middle of the 1800s uh, and also a significant source of outside investments. Um, this idea of U.S. Uh, planters investing in lands outside the territory of the United States is one that comes up again and again and that you can kind of use to weave different eras together, uh, both here in the 1850s, talking about the Austin Manifesto, and then again later on in the 1890s, talking about places like Hawaii. 1840s, uh, President James K. Polk is the first president uh, to consider purchasing Cuba. He floats the idea of spending $100 million on it, which was an absurd amount of money uh, for the time. Uh, Spain's reply was more or less that it would rather see it sunk into the sea uh, than fall into U.S. hands. That offer from President Polk is coming around 1848. Um, a few years later, Southerners decide enough with diplomacy. Uh, let's just raise some private armies and give it a go ourselves. These are the two ill-fated filibustering uh, expeditions from the Spanish uh, filibustero or pirate uh, that seek to unilaterally overthrow the Spanish government in Cuba and just claim it for the South without any U.S. government involvement. Um, the second of those ended with uh, over 50 of the uh, volunteers who went into Cuba being executed or strangled. Um, Southerners will end up raiding, I believe it is the uh, uh, Spanish consulate in New Orleans over that and uh, busting that particular building up because of this controversy that the Spanish had so unjustly executed our rabble rousers, simply trying to overthrow the government in one of their territories. How dare we? Um, <clears throat> things uh, further escalate in 1854 when a U.S. vessel called the Black Warrior is uh, seized by the Spanish. Um, this prompts calls for war uh, on the part of Southerners, of course, with the asterisk that part of that war with Spain should be the seizure of Cuba. Um, so Cuba is an absolute gem in Southern eyes. This entire time though, the North is looking on this with a great amount of suspicion um, because uh, Cuba was sizable enough and uh, uh, 
documents from uh, Southerners interested in Cuba uh, show that there were plans to maybe divide it up into a few states, not just one, uh, with two senators coming from each quite conveniently to help swing that balance of power. So I like to use memes from time to time in my class. I love political cartoons, uh, but I tell my students, uh, you know, you have a modern equivalent of this and it's called the meme. Um, it's just transformed into a different media. And so with my upper level students, especially, I'll sometimes throw this up on the screen. It's usually pretty memorable. They end up getting it pretty quickly that, okay, I see how this relationship is going. Um, and it's part of that souring that's uh, occurring, that further souring of uh, relations between Northern states and Southern states going through the 1850s. So let's talk about a manifesto and bring some James Buchanan. All right. So in 1854, because there's a lot of Southern pressure being put on President Franklin Pierce um, to go to war with Spain. Um, interestingly, right, Pierce is a northerner, but he has a lot of Southern sympathies. So that's something you often have to straighten out with students' minds that, yes, a, uh, a northerner can be Southern sympathetic in this time. The parties and uh, allegiances are not quite as well defined as they will be in the decade that follows. Um, <clears throat> Pierce is uh, toying with the idea of what to do to keep his own party in line and favorable to him, while also not sending the United States into a premature war with another empire. The U.S. envoys to Britain, France, and Spain, the envoy to Britain, by the way, is future President James Buchanan, uh, meet in Austin, Belgium to discuss what should be done. And the manifesto is the result. Uh, this top secret document, or supposed to be top secret document, proposed an offer of up to $130 million for Cuba. So maybe the extra $30 million will do away with that whole sink into the sea thing. Um, should be made to Spain. And if Spain should reply with the whole sinking narrative once more, we would be justified in wresting it from Spain, which is the uh, ill-fated wording they choose to insert into the document itself. Interestingly, uh, the document itself does not mention slavery at all or slave economies or Southern power uh, in the uh, manifesto. Instead, what the authors uh, cite is a fear of Africanization of the island and the concerns that that would create for U.S. domestic security. Specifically, what they're referencing is issues with uh, slave uprisings in uh, what is now Haiti, uh, and the fear that should that spread to Cuba, that that could then spread to the United States. Again, not directly referencing the South, even though that's uh, the region that would be most affected by this. Pierre Sol or Sole, uh, not sure on that pronunciation, uh, who is our envoy to Spain in an act of hubris or just complete indiscretion, ends up leaking the document to the New York Herald, where it is then printed in its entirety. Um, this causes a substantial amount of backlash. The Republicans uh, uh, are up in arms because they fear that this is all just a plot by Southern Democrats in particular uh, to seize more power, which it is. Uh, and the international community is also incensed. They become highly suspicious of U.S. expansionist intentions, which they should. Uh, and we are going to make very good on that uh, a half a century later. So the documents that I chose to work with in this lesson, as I mentioned before, I love political cartoons as sort of antiquated memes, um, are cartoons relating to the presidential election of uh, 1856. So I'm stepping two years out from the instance itself and looking at political ramifications. And I love these cartoons because, of course, they're being cranked out by various political perspectives and allow you to kind of turn and look at the issue um, from various facets. The lead cartoon here that I actually think is most interesting is the Austin Doctrine. Um, here we see James Buchanan uh, basically being first down by a group of hoodlums, uh, as they're called by the Library of Congress. Um, and what's interesting about them is they are very obviously depicted of a low socioeconomic stature. This is not a favorable, de favorable depiction of these hoodlums. Um, 
to my eyes, uh, at least two of them, uh, the one holding the gun to Buchanan and then the one on the far left are very clearly representations of Irish. Uh, the one on the left is most certainly Irish, and the Library of Congress agrees because he's holding a shillelagh in his hand, which is a traditional Irish fighting stick. Now, when you zoom in on the demands being made to Buchanan, uh, the language used by each of the hoodlums or thugs is the actual language from the Austin Manifesto. So interlaced with this kind of uh, ethnic slur language, uh, uh, is the very high-minded language of the manifesto. Uh, and why do we think the idea of this would be? Why depict hoodlums uh, and have them use very uh, uh, kind of low levels of speech that is then interlaced with the manifesto? What's the implication? Uh, that the Austin Manifesto was um, concocted with the basest kinds of, you know, uh, motives involved that would only benefit the basest population of the United States. Yeah, exactly. Um, that the United States was acting as a thug would act internationally. If we're going to make these sort of open threats that you either accept my bribe for your territory, or I'm going to wrest it from you. And yeah, that this represents the basis instincts of the basis levels of society. And bless their hearts, if that's the thinking in this time period, Irish Catholics are going to be brought into it. Um, which is one of the reasons I love this cartoon, uh, is that you can then use it to launch into a whole nother discussion of why are two of the four thugs Irish in an era coming immediately after the 1840s. Right. You can bring in uh, ideas of immigration in the Black 40s and uh, Anglo concepts of persons of Irish descent into this as well. Um, also here, I think a really strong uh, political statement about the typical support of the Democratic Party by persons of Irish descent, specifically Irish Catholics. So moving forward to the next cartoon. Uh, a little different angle here. Um, this one, uh, very nativist as well, but uh, we have some really interesting commentary on slavery this time as well. Uh, so in the lead in this particular race to the White House uh, is Millard Fillmore, uh, who is uh, running a very pro-nativist campaign, being pulled by Young America, right, with a very healthy looking steed uh, pulling the cart. Uh, coming in second is Buchanan riding on Pierce's shoulders. Uh, and uh, in some of the smaller uh, labeling on the cartoon, uh, them being in second place is alluded to uh, them having been put on, you can see down here in the lower right, the Austin course. So the Austin Manifesto is still weighing heavily in the minds of uh, political commentators, even here in 1856. And then really interesting over here, uh, being pulled by the near dead horse, uh, drowning in the abolitionist cesspool, uh, is John Fremont and uh, uh, his wife being pulled in that rather uh, decrepit um, cart. And there in the lower right is Mr. Beecher, right? Father of famous Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, with his Beecher Bible, which was a rifle sent with many uh, pro-unionists into Kansas when that whole bleeding Kansas thing is going on. And just, again, the idea here that the nativists see the concept of ending slavery uh, as something that's just going to weigh the country down. So this one, not so much a pro-slavery stance as a nativist stance. Um, and that nativism is on full display because if you look at the cross there across Fremont's shoulder on the far right, uh, there were allegations that he might be Catholic at the time. And that cross is meant to stand for its Catholicism. So anti-Catholicism coming back in just like in the previous cartoon. Third cartoon here, we see uh, Buchanan as uh, the lowly tailor sitting alone in a room, which is a smack against him being the nation's only bachelor president. Um, he has no wife to care for his clothing or keep his house well kept. So he is just here in his bachelor pad uh, looking over his old Federalist coat. Buchanan had switched from being a Federalist in the late 1820s 
uh, to being a Jacksonian Democrat. Um, and here he is admiring his own cope, saying uh, it's not a bad patch job from being a Federalist to being a Democrat. Um, and you can see the patch there that is labeled, meaning it's the most important patch on making him a true Democrat, uh, a patch labeled Cuba, uh, which is, again, a direct reference to the Austin Manifesto and his involvement uh, as the one thing that would get Southern Democrats particularly to vote for him. The last cartoon here brings in uh, the perspective of a free soiler. Um, thoughts on this one. After the others that we've looked at, there's definitely a lot going on here and a lot that can be used to unpack the rather complex views of uh, abolitionists, uh, non-abolitionists, and those people who are just trying to move west, sometimes known as free soilers. I have a real visceral reaction to this. Okay. It makes <laughs> me want to gag. <laughs> I think the cartoonists will be very happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah that's exactly obviously there. that's what they were going for. Um, it's, yeah, it's disturbing. Um, yeah, and I love how the Free Soiler is tied to the platform, literally. Yeah, tied to the Democratic platform, uh, one key element of which, one key plank of which is Cuba. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Karen said she does not use this one with her fourth graders. And <laughs> yeah, 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 I can see why. Um, yeah. Yeah, fourth grader might run crying from the room. I mean, you do have a guy hung in the tree on the upper right-hand corner, if you didn't yeah, notice that nice little that? detail yet. Is that is that mentioned in the um the blurb about this political cartoon on the bibliographic page, or is that just supposed to add to the ambiance of the democratic? <laughs> yeah, I think it is just ambiance um, because it's not clear ethnically or racially what the figure is. The Library of Congress blurb only mentions it as a figure hanging from a tree. Uh, okay. which complements the scene on the left-hand corner of a frontier house on fire with a woman and child running from it. Oh, so in other words, free soil is chaos. <laughs> well, this one, uh, yeah, or at least the Democratic platform, the free soilers being tied to it is bringing chaos. Uh, free soilers yeah. felt like they were having slavery shoved down their throats when yeah. uh, folks back east are making their arguments. And it's important to remind students, if you do talk about free soilers, that free soilers are not in it for freedom for everyone. Free soil does not mean abolition. Free soil means free soil for white people. Okay, so on the previous uh, uh, cartoons, we've got multiple perspectives showing how Cuba is just as an important or as important of a part of choosing a candidate in 1856 as anything that we would typically study related to uh, Kansas or other Western territories. While it's on the back burner for us, it certainly wasn't on the back burner for people um, at the time. The last source that I link in the lesson plan is uh, an article from the Fayetteville Observer, uh, a newspaper here in Tennessee. And overall, the article approaches Buchanan from an incredibly positive viewpoint. Uh, the previous political cartoons were not all that flattering of Buchanan or his party. Um, but here we see a Tennessee paper uh, saying it's a strong ticket. Uh, it's a ticket that true American people, which is a key phrase, by the way, true American people will delight to support. Um, that old buck tis a good nickname for he belongs to the old school of men as well as statesmen. So a very kind of reactionary attitude here, right? He's one of the old stock the uh, rare breeds that are quickly uh, failing in terms of statecraft. Um, it is typical of his unaffectedness. It marks a man without pretension. Uh, it denotes one who has grown gray in the democratic service. So definitely very, very positive for Buchanan. Um, and it's key to note here with students, I think as you look all throughout the 1850s, uh, the Southern perspective on what they were doing. And I like the little emblem here uh, in the blurb for uh, the Fayetteville Observer. Here in the eagle's mouth, right, resting on a flag of democracy is a banner, the union, it must be preserved. 
One of the important things to remember is that as Southerners are coveting Cuba, as they are setting the stage for what's going to be, uh, you know, the coming war, from their perspective, they are upholding what the Union always should have been. Uh, they are the protectors of the original intent of the founders. Uh, they see themselves as taking the country back to uh, a state of greatness that it had once been imbued with. Um, and that the pro-abolition Northerners are actively seeking to tear down. Um, <clears throat> so it's a good source to kind of end with, to complicate the vision of, uh, of Buchanan, to complicate the vision of what Southerners had in mind, um, while still keeping in focus these uh, uh, flare-ups that are occurring throughout the decade. Now, from there this uh let's see stop that share i did want to just mention a few other things uh that i tend to do with this um further connections that can be made uh, especially if you happen to teach at the high school level uh looking forward would be uh bringing cuba back again for the spanish-american war discussions of the platt amendment how does u.s involvement in cuba and the war there ultimately uh play into the cuban revolution and the ascension of Fidel Castro, and then how is that playing into relations when you get to the 1960s and things like the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the real truth is Cuba is at the heart of the American drama uh, for about 150 years, and we don't really give it credit for being at the heart of the drama until nukes are involved. And that's unfair uh, because there's such a much, there's such a rich story that comes in uh, before that. So uh, if you wanted to expand a lesson, you had extra time and you wanted to take it farther. Those are all things that can be brought in to uh, uh, flesh it out and bring it into modern times. Okay, I think I'm done. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so this was definitely digging into two of our lesson ideas for this month in quite uh, a good amount of depth. Uh, I'm just going to show for you one more time the slide that has the link to our um, feedback, excuse me. So uh, here I'm going to copy this URL and I'm going to drop it into the chat box for those of us who are uh, joining us. And so please uh, fill out the form and uh, we will be getting you your certificates for participation. Thank you again for joining us. There are, of course, additional primary and secondary sources related to the 1850s on our newsletter that hopefully you will be able to explore if you have time. And so thank you to Ken, and we will hopefully see you all next month. Can you stop the recording?